Uh, so welcome all who have come here. This is the Trail Building and Maintenance 101. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, of course, I'm Chris Ludwig. I have been leading trail crews since 1996 in the BC Mountaineering Club, so I've been doing this a long time. And um, I'm also, of course, the club president. Another interesting thing is I joined the club at uh, 18 years old, uh, and now I'm 48 years old. When I first walked in the Anza Club back in 92, I think it was somewhere in then, I was introduced to a gentleman back then, his name is Paul Binkert. Of course, Paul Binkert, we may, some of you may know, is the, the Lions Trail is named after Paul Binkert. And so, um, if by the way, if everyone can uh, mute, I can mute you, but if we can just start out muted, that would be great. Um, and uh, I was mentored by a number of the uh, trail builders at the time, Seb Heiberg, and I remember one time I was hiking the Silver Daisy Trail with him, and he would have been maintaining that trail and built it, and he would gave me the tour of this is how I build this trail, introducing me drain water, dealing with water and drainage and tread. And so I took over the years those techniques and also what Paul Kubik shared with me and built some of my own techniques. Uh, I feel a certain moral obligation, as you will, to pass down the information I've learned and share it with the next generation, uh, just as those early BCMC members did for me. And they were very kind. They were very patient and attentive for me. Uh, it's sort of a, a tr tradition of ours. So that being said, in this one, uh, I'm going to go through the different points on the uh, uh, little course outline I put together. Uh, we're going to start off with the boring stuff. And after each of the seven sections, if you want to text me questions, because I'm a one-person technical show here, um, uh, please feel free to do so. So the first one is number one, which is in some ways the... Uh, the driest of the topics. I saved all the fun stuff to the end of, of, of images and how to build stuff so that way you're stuck listening to the boring stuff first and you get to see all the fun stuff at the end. Any good presenter will do that. So uh, route planning authorization and land jurisdiction. Ooh, ugh. So obviously you can't just build a trail anywhere you want because if you do that, you're going to get into some trouble. And it's generally a good idea to think about where you're going to build your trail before you do it, uh, as opposed to plunging right through and uh, making it up as you go along. And then it will look like some of the old trails from the built in the 1920s and 30s, which basically start at the valley bottom and go straight up the mount, side of the mountain. And we try to do a better job of that now, nowadays. Uh, I'm hearing a couple people uh, in the background still unmuted. If you can all oh, please make sure you're muted. I think I have a global mute button here somewhere. Uh, blah, 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 sorry, let's figure out the mute. Ah, no, not mute myself. <laughs> uh, ah, it's Ian. You know, Ian, if you can please mute yourself. Okay, so continuing along, thank you. Uh, so the first one is land jurisdiction. So in British Columbia, we have many different kinds of lands that are, uh, who, are, who are controlled by a variety of different agencies and individuals. Of course, we have private lands. We have crown land, and uh, which is uh, mystery forest lands, natural resource. Uh, and uh, we have parks. Sometimes we have park, BC Parks, we have Parks Canada, although Parks Canada, there's not a lot of those around here, uh, with the exception of the Gulf Islands and the West Coast Trail. We have uh, also Metro, so we have city uh, and metropolitan uh, uh, land managers, and they all have their different sets of rules. Um, and I'm going to, I am most familiar with building land on Crown land. If you're going to be wanting to build in a park, it's something you can't do unless it's authorized by BC Parks and also is something that would be in their management plan as well. So you can't 
you can't on your own start building trails within a park. You're going to have to be working with that agency. It's a long process. Uh, and it's the same thing as Metro has its its rules, although they're not quite as flushed out as, as say, BC Parks or, or Flinro in terms of the rules and regulations. I'm going to talk specifically about Flinro. Flinro, uh, in terms of building trails, uh, is governed by the Forest and Range Practices Act. There are certain things you can do on Crown land without authorization, and there are certain things that you must have authorization for on Crown land. And uh, again, if we can all mute, please, when you come in. Uh, so uh, some of the things you can do on Crown land is one is you can clear uh, pre-existing logging roads uh, of vegetation, and you can do what's known referred to as incidental clearing of brush. In other words, you can, if you're trying to put in a route, you can put up flagging tape and you can clear enough brush for you to get through, but that brush must not be merchantable timber, meaning that that cannot be timber that would be of uh, value sold on the market. In order to cut timber on Crown Land, you need a timber falling license. Um, so the other thing you cannot do uh, without authorization is you cannot build structures and, and you cannot disturb the ground. So you can't do grubbing uh, as well. Now there's different authorizations under the act. Um, the BC Mountaineering Club has a number of, of authorizations. We actually have 50, section 57 trails and section 56 trails. We, a water sprite trail, for instance, is a section 56 trail, which means that is, if it is damaged by industry or anyone, then that company must pay to re repair it. And on a section 57 trail or 56, we can put up markers, we can build structures, and uh, we can uh, grub and, and uh, put in trail bed. Um, that You can't do that if you don't have authorization. Now, that being said, there are a number of trails out there which don't have authorization. They can be either grandfathered in from before the act uh, or they're rogue. Um, and there's, we all probably know, I've encountered lots of rogue trails out there. Uh, here in this workshop, we're going to focus on doing legitimate uh, authorized trail building. Uh, so in, in the case of BC Parks, um, you would want a partnership agreement with them. Uh, in the case of the club, actually does have a partnership agreement uh, with BC Parks for two separate trails. We actually have one for Manning Park now. Are pursuing that and one for um, Sigurd as well. Uh, so that's it's a little bit different depending on the agency. Uh, so the important thing is that before you start hacking and slashing, know the rules and, and, and play within them because uh, you can get into trouble. Um, and but you say there's a lot you can do uh, without having the blessing of government, i.e., if you're just clearing an old logging road. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. That's one of the benefits of working with old logging roads. And certainly uh, one of it is, is you're not going to do more damage with hand tools on a, on a logging road or a chainsaw than a heavy industry did back in the day when they built it. Uh, any questions on, on uh, rules? I could get into great detail, but I'm not going to harp on that at, at great length. You can send me a text if you, if you have a question about jurisdiction and authorization. Section 56, Section 57. Oh, oh, and you do, if you want a Section 56 or 7, you have to apply for them as well. There's a bit of paperwork involved, though it's not that onerous. And you can find that under the, under the uh, government website. Um, going on, let's talk about route planning, because that's really critical here. So route planning um, it is an interesting thing, because uh, especially in the West Coast, we get a horrendous amount of rain. And um, if you build your trail straight up at the side of the mountain, you're going to have a number of issues. So those issues will include you're going to have water, uh, topsoil loss, and the trail bit will be destroyed just from people using it. This is a topographical rendering of the Water Sprite Lake Trail, the bottom section. You notice a couple things about this. Um, so you, can we all, just someone say, uh, Sue and Terry, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, yes we can. Okay, so this is an old road here. And then there is a, this is an upper road. So there's a, a logging road here and there's a logging road down here. And this is what's known, we call the connector trail and it connects between the two logging roads. And what you'll notice about it is notice the contours about that 
are a bit of a bubble. It's almost like a little ridge in here. Whereas let's suppose over here, the original, when we first entered this area in 2014, we hacked a root up here. Now this one is about 25 degrees, 20 to 25 degrees steep. This one is about 5.7 degrees. There's obviously clearly going straight up here, as tempting as it is, probably isn't such a great idea. Um, so there was a number of places as I knew I had to connect the lower logging road to the upper logging road. And, and so at some point along this road, I had to depart and connect to the upper one. And you can see naturally the point where I departed the road is the place with this natural sort of ridge line, the smoothest point here. I didn't go in here, which is an indented valley, but I specifically pre-planned and moved up this contour. This is really important in trail planning. And it's something that we have more uh, resources now than we used to in the past. So we have Google Earth with time-lapse. We have the bivouac.com website, um, and even the topographic maps on the backcountry BC uh, website. So um, before you, if you're putting in a new route, it is really, really important to understand your topography. Um, there's another term we trail builders talking about that's called microterrain. And microterrain refers to the bumps and, and sort of uh, features of the land that are so small that cannot be seen on the topographic map. So little cliffs, you know, bouldery, rocky, such things that might make it challenging to build a trail. And microterrain is something that you develop experience dealing with. Um, by in some ways by instinct, but basically the more you spend time in the mountains, the more time you spend building trails, the better you get at putting in and navigating micro terrain. Now, how do you find old sources of old logging roads? Well, uh, in the case of the Skookum, this is the same water sprite trail, but with all of the a map of the, all of the old logging roads in the valley. Uh, back in the day, these were uh, given names by Macmillan Blodell when they were in service. So this one happens here is known as the S line. S stands for Skookum. This one is the S, uh, S1 here, which stands for Skookum 1. And then there's two more. They're actually not on this map, but there's this S2, and there's an S3 and an S4 uh, up the valley. So this, they had interesting naming systems. Um, this happens to be in bivouac, the T4, um, and backcountry BC is the California Topo, has all of these old map, old logging roads on them. So you can kind of pre-plan, you know, where your route's going to go based on what roads there are and sort of maximize them. So you can see when I put in the water sprite trail, you know, I followed this old logging road here, and then I departed, made a connector up to this old logging road, came here, departed that old logging road and then continued it along here. And now the new demon trail we're putting on follows this logging road. Logging roads are, are useful in areas with high uh, water flow, um, meaning that where if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna have a lot of foot traffic um, because they've been packed down by logging trucks over decades typically. Um, unfortunately, the bad thing about logging roads is they're also home to the dreaded red alder, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, so the moral of this story is do your research. Um, and there are people in the club like myself who are happy to be a resource for you as well and can direct you to places where you can get this kind of mapping information. Um, but even on the Backcountry BC website, if you go to the Cal Topo map, all these roads are, are in there. Um, or the bivouac.com site's an excellent resource as well. And there's many others out there. Um, any questions on topography? Okay. Ah, Ulnus rubra of vegetation. You notice in the least concerned category, also known as the red alder, the scourge of the West Coast, grows fast, chokes out roads and trails without mercy. Um, and uh, you must, as a trail builder, contend with this little devil because it will turn your trail into this. Yay. And it will do so in only a couple of years. 
So what do you do about it? Now, of course, the, the um, Alnus rubra has an interesting range on the West Coast here. And you'll notice that that's smack dab in the middle of where, of course, we are. <laughs> infesting uh, where we are. And they really like logging roads and logging slash. Um, but it was interesting is they do have a, an ecological purpose. So in Oregon State, they started getting, after uh, the Vietnam War, they had a surplus of napalm and Agent Orange. So they decided that they used that to get rid of the uh, alder. And they discovered that that was a bad idea because alder uh, is actually a nitrogen fixing plant, meaning that it restores the nitrogen in areas that have been logged out. And what that does is it allows the regeneration of conifers, the evergreens. And what they found is when they nuked all of the uh, red alder with the agent orange, uh, that suddenly the conifers didn't grow back. It's almost like nature knew what it was doing. So one of the challenges we have with this stuff is it's apart from the fact that we try to cut it right down at the bottom, right at the base, and then we leave the evergreens uh, in place. It's very important to leave the evergreens wherever, wherever possible, um, simply because they uh, tend to stop this kind of stuff. Oh, I see a comment here. Was the ability to clear vegetation flagging tape apply to crown land or did it apply to all agencies? No, no, that is only crown land. Um, uh, again, yeah, BC Parks, the, Different, different organizations have different requirements. They, I see Jay answered that, uh, so I did too. But um, so this stuff also, when the snow hits, it tends to go bleh, and it becomes a tangled mess for skiers, which is no fun. Now, the problem with the alder is when, if you clear it back too far, then you get a whole bunch of sun comes on the road and encourages growth, and then it all grows like crazy. Similarly, if you don't cut enough of it, then it all goes blah, and then you can't hike through it in the, in the shoulder season. So it's finding that sweet spot, something called an alder tunnel. I mean, it's clearing it back enough that you can go through easily as, as hikers, but at the same time, not clearing it so wide uh, that it encourages growth. And one of the way fights I've learned to do it is once you clear the initial trail, every year, anything that's come down, you clear out, but you don't clear much more than that. So that it's always getting just a little bit wider, but you're still keeping you know, that stuff on the side to provide shade. And that's what we call an alder tunnel. Some of you may have hiked in an area where you've got this tunnel of all alder and yet there's an old road bed in the middle. You know, like they say about Mount Loffington, the chain ranges like that. There's lots of examples. Um, so it's always that balancing act. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to cut them up high. So in the case of this alder, if you cut it up high, what will happen is it it'll just go blah, you know, like an octopus. So you want to get it down close to the ground or even ideally tear them out of the ground. But most importantly is, is cut these things right down to the ground. And that presents an interesting problem. So when you are cutting them down to the ground, say with a pair of loppers, um, you always run the risk. You have to make sure not to, of course, hit the rock or the ground with your blade, you'll doubt, or to twist when you're cutting those. And we'll talk about tools in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, the alder is definitely a, a, a significant challenge on the coast um, and, and probably uh, probably the greatest challenge as a plant, especially in their juvenile form. Um, so it's, it's a constant battle. Um, any questions on, on vegetation? I could talk a lot more about that. We're going to talk about different kinds of wood in a little bit and their rot decay rates. Uh, every once in a while, I see a, a random holly tree out near a trail, and it just um, it just strikes me as not supposed to be there. Would that be something we'd want to pull out? Um, is a holly tree, uh, I'm not sure if it's an invasive species. It's an invasive species, kill it, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, as my, my girlfriend actually works in... Uh, in federal government dealing with invasive species. So yeah, if, if it's invasive species, um, but if it's not, you know, it, I, I tend to be, if it's, it's a larger tree and it's, 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 it's stabilizing the soil, you know, I tend to it, it, err on the side of trying to let things be unless it's this kind of older stuff on the trail. Holly is an invasive species. Oh, it is. So take it out. Yes. Get, rid of, get rid of it. If it's and an invasive it's, species. It spreads. It's bad news. Yeah, yeah, no, get rid of any, any evasive species, broom, you know, holly, all that stuff, get rid of it. Okay, tools, yeah, tools, fun part. 
So there we are, tools, some of our tools. By the way, any other, let me, I'm just gonna go back, make sure I've covered. Uh, resources, yeah, oh, the other thing about, we're gonna get into tools on resources. Um, so tools, one of the things is BC Mountaineering Club does have a trail tool building cache. Uh, we keep that in North Vancouver. Uh, so if you are putting a crew together to do some work, um, you know, let us know uh, and uh, we can give you access to that. Um, and there's a lot of these tools up there. So here's some of the sort of the standard ones. Um, Pulaski, which is uh, uh, kind of a useful tool because you can, uh, at the top, it has a cutting blade on the end for cutting wood. And then you have also on the other end, uh, a tool that you can use to grub and, 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 and dig. McLeod is a tool I don't see used so often on the coast. I've used a McLeod. McLeod is great for removing debris with a spiky end. And uh, the other end you can use to, uh, to uh, actually carve trail bed out. It's a heavy tool and you actually take it, you swing it from your back like this and then overhead. Um, I actually like it. I like McLeod's. It's a good work, good shoulder workout. A rake, a shovel um, is obviously key for doing drainage and also for digging in, you know, putting, if you're building structures, you're going to need a shovel to uh, you know, dig it out so that it's even and level. Uh, we use bent shovels here. So actually, I think, uh, Brian, you sent me a, an email about that as we, and we call, they're called them the Binkert shovels after Paul Binkert. So it's a spade like this, and it's bent at a 90 degree angle. Really quite good, because when you're doing drainage work, you can just uh, uh, haul out, grub out all that muck. A rake is good behind a brush cutter, or if you have a whole team of loppers. So, uh, so say you have eight people cutting with loppers. You know, loppers are are these tools or a brush cutter, a gas powered brush cutter and a, a rake bends you constantly bending over and grabbing the stuff and throwing it over the bank out of the way. Um, and actually I have one here, uh, one that I like to use, uh, which is this. So if I'm falling behind a brush cutter, rather than having to bend over, it's got a nice long handle and uh, these prongs up here, a garden rake, I find it all sticks in the, in the, um, in here and you're constantly having to pull the stuff out. These ones are actually the, the wider prongs like this are, are less of a nuisance. So that's, this is a great tool if you're what's called a brusher. In other words, you're, you're, you're or, sorry, swamper. So when we have people up front clearing the vegetation, they're the cutters and then the people in the back are the swampers. Uh, swampers are the people who remove the fallen debris uh, cut down. And of course, loppers here, um, I've got many different kinds of loppers. So these are the uh, little ones. These are a, a, sort of a, a premium Swiss one and they cut like crazy. The small ones are great um, because they, um, uh, you know, you can be up high and you know, it's just, they're light, super light and they cut well. They don't have the huge diameter for cutting the really big stuff, um, but they're really, really good um, at really cutting small stuff really quickly. Now, if we want to go big, this is the, the almost $300 monsters I have here. So these are the, the serious ones. I've got a pair of even bigger ones than these. They're, they're light, they're, they're just the Swiss Falcos. Um, you really do get what you pay for with loppers. So I have two pairs of loppers that are 20 years old. Um, if you get really cheap ones, you might get one trip out of them. So, whereas I've, mine I can sharpen many times. They are, you know, they are a bit pricey, like these ones they say are 300 bucks, but they last forever. And then also everyone fights over these ones as opposed to the club ones. So there's usually arguments on any trip as to who gets to borrow mine. Pry bar, you'll see pictures later on in my slideshows. Um, basically pry bar is useful for moving logs, moving rocks, very, very critical. Some are a hollow aluminum tube. The point is you don't wanna be doing leverage in the middle as you'll wreck the pry bar. That's always down here. The bow saw. Um, is very light and for hand cutting. I also have my own hand saw like this. Um, they're also folding saws. I used to use folding saws, but I find they kept breaking on me and they just weren't rugged enough. So I, I went with the, the fixed saw, which uh, I find a little bit more reliable. I, I go through less of them this way. This is a Fiskars, you know, not like the cat food of Friskers. <laughs> I don't know why my mind went there. Um, and then, of course, the, the axe. Now, I have a hatchet as well. Hatchets, um, 
A really good one you're working with a chainsaw operator is if you have often you're clearing logs that are on the ground and the top of the chainsaw is covered in rot and muck. So what I'm, if I'm working with a chainsaw operator, say I've got one of these and they're cutting, I might take this and hack off all the, the, the moss and, and rot off the top and then they're free to cut it without hurting their, their blade. Um, so a hatchet, you know, is a lightweight, uh, small compact tool, but it can be very, very helpful especially when working with um, a, a mechanized operator. Uh, so yeah, as opposed to a full ax, which is a little heavier. A full ax is nice too, but you know, I just like the, I like doing the hatchet job. Um, some other ones here, um, uh, standard tools, of course, are sledgehammers, which are, are, are vital. Um, I like these ones uh, because they have Oh, here, there's an example of kind of Brian's got a bent shovely kind of thing there. That, those are awesome for drainage work and grubbing. This one has the hammer on the end, but it also has the point on the end. So I found that these are great for, uh, for reaming out things. You know, if there's a, a ditch or something you want to smash through a root or something, this is kind of multi-purpose. This would be a full sledge because it has a long hammer. And this is a mini sledge, it has the short hammer. This is a three pounder. There are times when we're pounding and rebar and this one, you know, it's, it hits a root or something and this one isn't quite heavy enough. So then you'll hear mini sledge, you know, a call out for, I need the mini sledge. So it, both have their, their uses. Uh, mini sledge, you can definitely pound harder. Uh, and then this one is something. So we have here a regular hammer and we have a finishing hammer. So the uh, finishing hammer is a little tiny one, but it's super light and it's great for putting out trail markers. Uh, so reflective trail markers such as, as these. And we at club, we have a number of these. The reflective trail markers are pre-drilled with a hole and you see it's really convenient. And then you take one of these little itty bitty nails. And one of the things you don't want to do when you're putting in trail markers is if you hammer this thing in right all the way to the tree, can anyone tell me what's going to happen that's not desirable if you pound this thing flush with the tree? The tree's going to grow around and try to envelop it. Yes, I have seen that. And then the mark trail marker gets all mangled. It's actually, it's kind of funny, actually, but it, it's <laughs> it not desirable to see this thing bent in 15 ways. So, but the, yeah, the trees will do that, that's for sure. So, we have lots of these in the club. You know, I've got boxes of them. Um, so, you know, if you do have an authorized trail and you want to, we and, and need access to them, let us know. Um, and of course, sometimes when we're building structures, we need one of these, which is a level, or we use a plumb line sometime uh, to see if our structure is level. Uh, all right. So, and of course, the screwdriver. The humble screwdriver, very useful at putting on uh, strapping uh, and we'll, or sometimes we use power screwdrivers. Uh, for transporting stuff, they have a wheelbarrow here at BC Mountaineering Club. We're the Beach Eat Mountaineering Club, so we tend to use the Home Depot buckets. Um, home, home Depot buckets uh, are good at moving gravel around. You'll see some of them in action in the pictures up ahead. Uh, questions on tools. Ah, uh, yes, the chainsaw operator. So you should not be operating your chainsaw in shorts and t-shirts, number of safety uh, per gear that's necessary. So your helmet and visor, your earplugs. Uh, when you're working with the team in the woods, we have what's called the circle of danger or the arc of danger, meaning that, and I always do a safety talk before I start any day with a crew. And that is there's an arc, a circle around us, which is the diameter of the tool. So in the case of, say, even this, this rake, which has a long handle, the circle of danger is the basically swinging of this tool around me. So everyone, unless there is eye and ear contact, should not be entering the circle of danger within someone who's uh, working with a tool or especially with a mechanized operator like a chainsaw operator or brush cutter because they cannot see, if they cannot see you, they do not know you're there, period. Yeah, in, really in cubs, in cubs, we call that the circle of blood. I like that too. Circle of blood, sir. I call it the circle of danger. But yeah, 
Um, brush cutter, we have a club brush cutter, which actually has a giant hedge trimmer on the end, which is awesome for dealing with the, uh, with the alder. You'll also see brush cutters with tri-blades on the end and, and the disc blades. Tri-blades are great for smaller stuff. The disc blades are if you have, are going through thicker vegetation and you have a bigger motor. I'm not going to get into chainsaw operations in detail here in terms of how to operate a chainsaw. Lots of very inexpensive courses on that. Uh, beyond the scope. And I'm going to talk about human resources a little bit. So one thing when you're a trail boss is, is organization is one of the keys. So this was a trail building trip where I was building two bridges and a boardwalk. And so organizing your crew is rather important. It's a bit like being an air traffic controller. So you'll notice on top of these piles, I have um, a different pieces of paper here that say where it's going to. If you look here, it actually says to the swamp. Another one says to the bridge so that everyone knows exactly where what's supposed to go. And of course, as trail boss, I'm wearing the yellow safety vest, so I'm easily identifiable. I'm also the first aid person typically, so and I have a first aid kit. So at the beginning, everyone should know who is the first aid person uh, on site so that there's no com confusion if an owie happens. I think in this summer, I heard suddenly, I have an owie. And uh, <laughs> so that does happen. <laughs> it's funny hearing a grown man yell, I have an owie. Um, so you can see the stacks of lumber. This happens to be pressure treated uh, two by sixes. And they're pre-cut. We pre-cut them to different lengths, depending on what the task would be. Now you can see that it gets to be a little chaos when you're dealing with a big crew, uh, especially actually with some big crews. So uh, uh, the more organized you can be before you unleash them upon the world, the better. Here's you see everyone kind of knows what they're doing. You know, the signs have laid out where everything's going. Um, so having that group talk at the beginning about safety, about what everyone's doing. If I have a large crew, I will typically appoint a, a, what I call my lieutenants. So let's say I have one brush clearing crew of eight or 12. They're clearing brush. And then I have another team that might be working on a bridge somewhere else. Then I appoint a lieutenant and that lieutenant has uh, one of these. Uh, so I'm in radio contact with the different groups. Uh, so you have one trail boss and then lieutenants, which are managing smaller groups uh, and doing sub projects. Uh, and radio communications. Again, there, there is no cell phone communications and those hand walkie talkies and CBs are not reliable. VHF radios are really essential if you're going to be doing it right, especially if you're doing it any, with any large group of people. Club does have a few for rental. Um, now let's get into building materials. Yeah, does anyone have any questions before I move on to this now we're getting, we say, say we're getting the more fun stuff now. Send me a text if uh, anyone has a question here. Oh, how can we borrow trail building tools? I see here. Um, we actually, yeah, we, I would say uh, we have a cache in North Vancouver. It's just email cabins and trails at bcmc.ca. Uh, and we can, we can arrange that. Um, now we're going to get, to get into a very important little chart here. Hopefully we can all read it. So building materials. Uh, I always say to people, know thine grain, which means know your different kinds of wood. And that's important because this little chart here talks about um, the, uh, how, the decay time uh, for, uh, sorry, I'm just, my computer's doing something funny here. The decay time for different kinds of natural woods. So you'll notice here the woods, the further to the left of the natural durability of this chart. Sorry, the lo the lo sorry someone's not muted and uh, they can mute in the background, please. So this one has a species chart. And, and again, any of these resources, if you want me to share them after this workshop, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. This chart talks about the natural decay rate of different um, uh, woods that we have on the West Coast. Very, very important to know as a trail builder. So you notice there's some woods you're probably going to want to stay away from if you're building structures. So like alder and birch will be rotten and gone in less than five years, in some cases even less than that. 
you'll see here that uh, the most durable wood on the West Coast, as the first peoples know, of course, is red cedar or yellow cedar, which is even more rare. And we do use a fair bit of yellow cedar, as I'll talk about later. So if you're building supports or bridges, you're going to be aware of what kind of wood you're using. Um, this is really, really critical stuff, uh, as it makes a difference whether your bridge is going to last 15 years or it's going to last two years. That's pretty significant. Um, you can see hemlock, not so great. And fir, Douglas fir is, it's actually, it's okay, but still, I, it's not my first choice. It's always, if I can find cedar, cedar to build a structure, that's what you're going to want to do. Any questions on wood? Of course, you could say how to identify them. Well, um, we'll look at some examples of that in a bit. There is a, a ease of preservation on that list. I mean, yeah. is how how often are these planks or, or pieces of wood actually preserved over time? Um, it tends to be talking about purchasing. I'm going to pressure treated wood. Um, I find I've had a lot of success with pressure treated wood, um, but there's a couple of tricks to that, and I'm going to talk about that. Is how to get the most out of your pressure treated lumber. Because if you put pressure treated lumber and pressure treated lumber can be fur um, and is typically I find. Uh, and what you really don't want is your pressure treated lumber to contact the water. So, uh, and I'm gonna show some examples that if, as long as your pressure treated lumber is in the air and, and has air under it, it will last. Uh, I have some boardwalk that was put in in 2016 that's like brand new, that's four by four pressure treated. Um, but it's how you prepare it and, and what's under it. And I'll, t I'll show some pictures and, and talk about that in more detail in a bit, okay? Um, so, uh, so quick question for you, Chris. Where, yeah. where do you get large dimension treated fur for uh, bridge timbers, like a uh, six by 12 or four by 12 or? Um, I get, I get all that stuff. At, I can get that all at Home Depot. And you know what I've done is, is I phone into Squamish ahead of time. And I say, I need, uh, I need say 20, uh, four by six by 12s and they will set it all aside for me and I'll show up and we just load it up in trucks and go. Okay. I've good. also for 50 bucks, they'll ship it to the airport too. And they'll fly it up where I need it to go. Um, so a lot of times I had about 50, 400 pounds on two occasions flown up to a location by a big helicopter. And so what I had is I had Home Depot for 50 bucks shipped all my lumber to the, to Black Tusk and then they trucked and trailered it up and they also pre-weighed it. So it's really convenient. Great, thanks. A couple other things to know about this is dimensional lumber. Now dimensional lumber is kind of interesting. Um, uh, and there's a couple things is you actually, the bigger you go, the more bang for the buck you get. So what it means is in a four by four, you actually aren't getting a beam that's four inches by four inches. So you're actually getting three and a half by three and a half. So in other words, it's not actually four inches thick, but when you go up to six inches, you get like five and uh, like three quarters. So you actually, it, it, it's a much bigger jump. So that's kind of interesting is you, you're getting cheated less oddly in dimensional lumber when you go bigger, um, as you can see by this chart. So when you go with a four by six, as I discovered, you get considerably bigger beam than if you went with a four by four. Um, and you can see the sort of the loss on the side, but yeah, the, what, the big difference, I don't have it here is, oops, is going up to four by six. Um, so you have three options kind of in, 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 in lumber. Uh, you can go with non-treated, uh, which is um, not such a great idea on the coast. It'd be great in the desert. Uh, pressure treated, and then you have cedar. Cedar is double the price, uh, and I, I typically go with pressure treated just for the cost. As much as I would like to go uh, with cedar, it's just not financially viable, especially now with these prices. One thing to know about pressure treated lumber is when you cut it, if I, if I take this beam and I cut it down the middle, it's now no longer waterproof. It's going to rot from those ends. So one thing I bring up is I bring up a paint tray and a bucket of pressure treating liquid. And we have a roller. A, you'll see some pictures later on of people rolling the ends of cut pressure treated lumber for that reason to preserve it uh, a little better. 
Interestingly, I've had steps buried in soft soil in the shade that are pressure treated and they, and I pulled them out about four years later and they're solid. Uh, for some reason, the low oxygen environment uh, reduces the rate of decay, oddly enough. Um, moving on here, uh, now we're actually getting into the building part of things. So here's um, trail bed. Trail bed's an interesting thing. So trail bed is the part that people walk on. And this is um, us, we were rerouting a portion of the Water Sprite Trail to a new bridge we built. You can see some of the ladies here are digging out from the slope, carving out that trail bed there. So one person is removing the roots uh, and so that the shovel can now dig out. Uh, and sometimes we use hand grubbing tools too, like, or, the, or even like a you know, plasky kind of thing but to grub this trail around. So it's, uh, especially considering 2000 people a year walk through this exact section now. Uh, so that's the rerouting. Okay, I'm going to now switch to another set of photos. And so I'm gonna close that, close. Uh, give me a moment, switch over. Let's go to drainage. A couple little drainage pictures here. Oh, water, water, what a problem you are. Okay, do you, you don't see my screen yet. No, let's go share. Okay, you see that? Okay, drainage. So water is a bit of a problem. It, it will destroy, to remove your topsoil, turn your trail into, a, into roots and to a mud hole. We don't like that. Control. If you can control water, you can preserve your trail pretty well. So this is an example of cross ditch uh, across, again, another section of the Water Sprite Trail. Um, so here you can see we've dug out with bent shovels. Can we all see me, by the way? If I this, and it looks like someone's got my finishing hammer pounding in rebar here, but this is the cross ditch with the water. And what happens is people, when they walk by, tend to, to you know, step around it, and then the soil collapses into the cross ditch. So what we did here, as you can see, we've reinforced the side that collapses with a piece of uh, two by four. And then in front of it is some rebar being pounded in to hold that, that lumber in place. So this is sort of a, a fortified cross ditch, if you will. And that's just to get the water so it doesn't pour out over the trail and protect the cross ditch from being filled up by the hikers stepping through it. In another case, we had a situation whereby uh, the, the road was flooded. So here we are creating a new drainage down the side of the, of the trail. So we're in essence, are creating a, a ditch down the side of the trail. Sherpa, Sherpa, come here. Sherpa. Can we all make sure we're muted, please? Sherpa. Brian, I think that's, that's you. Um, so here we are creating a drainage down the side of the trail. Um, and so this, this whole section you can see was turning into muck uh, because this was standing water. So you had to get that standing water off. So this, these are techniques of, of, of basically drying a thing off without having to cover it in boardwalk. That's the next step. So if, if trying to basically dry and protect the trail bed without having to, ca to cap it with boardwalk. So here's that side ditch that we're digging out. Uh, and you can see another picture of where now later on, and you see we're reinforcing that side ditch with a bit of, uh, uh, a bit of lumber and rebar there. And see it flowing. I always like going, as once the water starts flowing, I love doing the Lord of the Rings. I uh, said, release the river. I always love that moment when it, when it starts flowing properly. Uh, so there we are there, water flowing as it should. Now there's some times where the water gets really to be a pain and it's causing all sorts of problems. And so in this case, we had a creek that actually overflowed the water sprite trail, the connector trail, and the creek was flowing right down here, right down the middle. And you can see it's actually almost dry there, but it was a full river flow. I came in in the spring and found a full river flowing down the trail. It's like, well, this won't do. So occasionally that pesky water, what had happened was, is the hikers had stepped in the little cross ditch and plugged it. Actually, this was the cross ditch here. 
um, and they kept plugging it up. So what we did is we actually dug out a better cross ditch and put a boardwalk over top. And so now people won't fill in the drainage ditch because they walk over the boardwalk instead. So yeah, the, the mover, movement of hikers themselves will, will tend to carve up your cross ditches. What's interesting is about two hours before, this was totally sat soaked and flowing with water. Two hours later, as, as of us remediating this, it almost, you can see it mostly dried up. So it will, water will behave pretty quickly, but you have to do the work. Uh, and do we have any other, and this is, um, again, looking down, you can see where we've taken uh, a place where there is water as a problem. This is now where the water flows up to the log and then goes out the side, and we've capped it off with a, a, with a, a boardwalk. Uh, so in other words, where it cannot be controlled in this manner, then we have to start moving to more vigorous means. Um, but this is, yeah, the classic cross ditch. And often with the cross ditches, you have to clear on the upside because it can get filled with debris on both ends. And, and it's a fair bit of shoveling and, and removal of, of, of vegetation to get these things flowing. So it's a, it's a clearing uh, cross ditches and uh, maintaining um, drainage is, a, is an annual job on a busy trail. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen even BC, heavy BC parks trails get completely obliterated by water. Um, you know, so water is a, is a big deal on the coast. Any questions? Yeah, you know, over the uh, winter and, and spring here, I, I've actually been on a few trails where either the trail starts or, or crosses up a stream, basically, where it's a very kind of rocky, gravelly bed in the, in the rain, which generally we get over spring and winter. It really was just kind of like traversing a, a small creek um is that like is that really okay i mean is that, oh that normal? i think probably the person either chose a poor route for it or didn't necessarily put in water water control there's a lot of trails that are that don't have active maintenance on the coast or won't weren't put planned um in other words the, you need to carefully plan your trail and if you are going to go into that kind of situation, then you may have to build structures, right? Quite, um, quite often, if there's not good water control, then the the creek starts running down the trail and turns the, creek, the trail into a creek. We had that problem with one of the creeks on Water Sprite, um, where basically a debris flow had came down and the logging road had a, actually a culvert. A culvert is basically a steel metal tube that goes under the bridge or road and all the water flows. It had gotten clogged with the debris and all the water were, from this river was pouring down one of the logging roads on the water spread trail. So we actually, we cleared it once with hand tools, with pulleys and chainsaws, it clogged up again. Last year we raised money and we flew in an excavator and did it right. So sometimes there are some jobs that in fact are too big for hand tools. Not often, but that's one example. So, and an example that Jay's talking about is, is once the water starts going, and then once the water goes over the road, then you lose the roadbed and you're left with just, you know, like say, you'll, if you look at some of the trails like around North Shore, uh, particularly like Brunswick and the Lions, it's all boulders. That's what happens once you lose that gravel and water flows over, it transforms it into a boulder uh, a walk and that's it's, it's horrible to hike um okay let's go on to by the way if you have questions keep going here i'm going to move on to another set of photos so now we're going to get into the funner stuff here uh so let's get into boardwalk construction boardwalk construction my favorite things who doesn't like boardwalk construction Okay, boardwalk construction. Sure. Ah, so so what are some options? So this this is the situation. What happens when you have um, a set of ground that you cannot drain? So this is ground that cannot be drained. Um, uh, then uh, you have to bring in some other options. So, so you can't do, the cross stitches aren't working. It's just, it's, it's turned into muck. There's too many hikers, there's too much water. Well, the most basic and, and time proven strategy is what's referred to as the log round. And so these are log rounds, the classic log rounds. So a log round, and here's another 
uh, view of the log rounds here. Wait a second. Oh, it looks like the same picture. Okay, so log rounds are basically you cut a log up into bits, you throw them on their sides. Now these things um, actually are very slippery on their own. So you'll notice what I've done on these log rounds is I've added track, steel traction plates. Uh, there are two other ways that you can um, go about this is that is you can uh, cap it with non-slip or you can put like a, a chicken wire I don't recommend. And we're going to talk about chicken wiring a little bit later. Uh, other, the old traditional is you take the chainsaw and you carve up a couple notches in the top of the round and you just go blah, 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 blah. I find those are still pretty slippery. Um, I find the best solution of these metal plates are really, really deluxe if you can get them. You put them on log rounds, people are not going to be slipping anywhere. These ones are divoted and have little gripping holes on them. Um, I've got some other designs of traction plates I'll show later on. Um, but these are, this is the most simple solution. Uh, it's not elegant, but it definitely works. Um, another thing too is they're not always even, you know, so they're a bit, sometimes a bit jumbly, not as elegant as a board mock. So what is a log round? Well, um, whoops. Let's see, for some reason, my, oh, I got a quick, two questions coming in here, I see. They float. <laughs> no, I don't want them to float. <laughs> <laughs> Do the log rounds float? <laughs> they kind of they they swim around a bit. They swim for sure. Yeah, especially if you ever walked on those those log rounds. Yeah, they do move. So this is um, us harvesting naturally fallen lumber. So we were on one trip and I found this lovely. This is yellow cedar. This is the and huge. This is the the piece de la resistance here. This is like the, the, the caviar of, of, of building materials in the, in the woods here. <laughs> so yellow cedar and it smells divine. Yellow cedar has this natural oil to it, like red cedar that, that prevents decay. So these things, this log was already 30 years old and look at it, 30 year old log. And it's like the day it was fallen. You know, this is an incredible building, natural building material. So let's talk about some, uh, the sort of my, my patented way of building boardwalk now, which is you take these things, uh, the rounds, and we cut them in half. And uh, then we put on top of them. And so this is us assembling a boardwalk. Um, this is a very simple and true method, a, a, a simple way of building a boardwalk. So we have these yellow cedar rounds that are cut in half or cedar. And then we have twin two by six by eights here, or it could be, doesn't matter the length. Um, and so that means in total over a foot in width. Um, very, very simple. They also last a very long time. These are pressure treated uh, beams. They last a really long time because they're very thick. Um, you know, like in the city, you'll see people when they build the boardwalks, they're using two by six decks. Here you're getting a thick boardwalk. They really do seem to hold up well over many years. Another thing I do, you'll notice that there's a space between all of these beams. So in this case, he's used a stick to put the spacer. So I request of, of my crew that they put a spacer between all the beams on the ends and in between the beams. And the reason being is as temperatures and moisture changes, the beams will contract and expand. And if they're pushed right against one another, they will crack and uh, you'll start seeing splitting and, and, and breaking of the beams. So what we do here is you notice we're spiking in typically with one of these, um, like a six spiral. With boardwalk using spirals is great because boardwalks have vibration where people are walking on them and the thing shakes. If you use spiral spikes, it will not shake loose. So this is the exact kind of, you can see here, the nail that we'll use in the ends of these things. And these are galvanized, so they're waterproof and don't rust. Hey, Chris, um, it's Jay, Jay yeah. just with a comment. I've heard that these are called plankways when the, <laughs> the, um, the beams go lengthwise as opposed to crosswise, but yeah. Yeah, I'll show you a design. Where I've, done, I've done different designs, yeah. so this, I, I'll show you a design where I did it with a deck. Yeah. Uh, another um, good suggestion is to pre-drill those holes so you don't split the wood. Yeah, actually, I, I actually have some examples of that later. You're already ahead of me, Jay. <laughs> so in this case, actually, um, I, I mean, yeah, you could pre-drill pre them. We do pre-drill them sometimes when we're using big spikes. 
So if you're using this, then you're going to want to pre-drill. And actually, I've got some pictures of us doing exactly that later on. So in this case, we're spiking in. And yes, I have seen, I actually have split the ends of these the odd time. Uh, spiking them in. So you do take your chances, as Jay says, when you spike these in. But you notice this is where the sledgehammer comes in. Sometimes, occasionally, someone will hit a knot. So even pressure treated lumber has knots, and all of a sudden the nail just goes, <laughs> bends on the top. And then I get to yell at people saying, stop wasting my nails, they're expensive, <laughs> even though it's not really their fault. Uh, so you can see these, the massive size of these cedar rounds are unbelievable. I just This is a, kind of a gorgeous boardwalk. Now here we're adding the deck to it, uh, which I call deck meaning the, the non-slip um, decking. So this is asphalt shingling. Um, there are other options and I'll, sh and I actually have some other options later on in pictures. Um, so this stuff we put in with roofing, galvanized roofing nails um, and they're pretty cheap. This is what they look like. And, they, and the thing about the roofing nails, they have a bigger head to them. And the reason they have the bigger head is so it doesn't punch through. Like if you use a small head like this one, see the different sizes of heads. If you use a small head, it will punch through the, the shingling and leave a hole and you've wasted your time. So that's why you go with these roofer, these galvanized roofing nails or hot electro as they call them, I think. Uh, and uh, particularly the points that receive the most traction are on the ends. So we tend to put a greater number in the end points and then just down the sides on these traction pads. And we do have to replace them on a regular basis, especially on a bridge or something where it's high use. Um, there's some discussion about the aesthetics of having a, a long straight boardwalk like this. It's better to have it, you know, often you're limited to the topography. Now here's an example where it's the same design of boardwalk, but uh, Lee and a club member and I actually had a donation of this thick expansion metal. And the expansion metal is, um, we had cut on a 50 ton press at Kwantlen College for free, custom fitted. This stuff is fantastic for a non-slip. And you, in this case, you don't use nails, you use staples. Um, and you see all the ladies here are on my crew are hammering in the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the decking with uh, staples. That's another option. I really recommend not going with chicken wire and the reason why is it rusts and breaks apart, and then it just is, it's ugly, it wrecks your boots, it's, it's a terrible option. Yeah, so you're better with going with one of these options or traction plates, which I will show some examples of in a bit. Um, and you can see also as a trail boss, you want to have lots of hammers. You don't want to have just one hammer. So make sure everyone has stuff to do. Um, let's see if I can find another example of a uh, yeah, so here's an example of a, a boardwalk with traction plate that I built last summer. So again, uh, kind of very, very simple. We're kind of lazy. You took two rounds, hammer, spiked them in with bigger spikes. But this one is covered in steel traction plates. Um, so this is kind of deluxe in a way, heavy duty traction plates. And see, I'm looking, I can see on my face there, I'm looking most satisfied admiring our creation. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's actually, it looks like a 12 footer too. That's a, a bigger, a bigger, uh, uh, longer beam. Now let's get on to a boardwalk design with a deck. So this one's kind of fun. So this is an interesting case. This was the first boardwalk we put in at water spray and it's using, uh, these runners. And you notice we didn't have a level that day. So you'll see on the left, we use what's a plumb line, a string to, to mark our level. Uh, so this is a place, an actual swamp, and it has constant groundwater and from a creek, it never dries. We, so you can see the cross dish, we tried to drain it and it would not drain. So the only option for managing this section was um, uh, to build a proper boardwalk. Now, because it's so soft, um, we built these in segments. You know, they're kind of alternating as well and that way um, it tends to hold tight together as a structure but also it allows flex um, because the ground's so soft the whole boardwalk kind of flexes because this is under the water completely underwater times in the year so here we have once again yellow cedar rounds but because um, these are only four by fours what i did you notice that this is an eight foot beam here runner and then we have one uh, round here and one round here. And then I put these in the middle. These aren't spiked in. 
These are spiked in Indians. This is not. And the reason why I put these ones in the middle is in case of the, this area gets covered in two meters of snow in the winter. And these four by fours, I was concerned might crack under the weight. So by putting these extra uh, uh, rounds at the halfway park, there's never more than three foot of free board or free beam here. Now talking about uh, also having your pressure treated lumber last longer is you'll notice that um, there's always free air underneath these beams at all times. That's really, uh, really critical. So that these beams are never in the water. That's when they will decay, uh, unlike cedar. So that's why I put the cedar rounds in the muck because that's what they excel at. And then the pressure treated lumber is on top of them where, where they don't have to sit in the water. So this is us putting the, basically the frame together. And then here's now the frame is assembled and we're starting to add the, the simple deck to the boardwalk. There's many different kinds of decks. Uh, there's also designs where you put posts into the muck, which is common you'll see, and then it'll have a little, a little railing on the side. So these are two by sixes. Uh, and then what we do, because they're cut pressure treated, we then took the roller and treated the ends. So here we're just starting to add the deck onto the, uh, onto the frame. Another picture now of us doing that, hammering them in. And then after that, now getting the, uh, you can see here, now they're putting on the non-slip, you know, the asphalt shingling on top. And you see how mucky that is under there. It's, it would be horrendous, right? Here's the, the one it's resting the weight on. And here's the round over here that's just sitting there in case there's some sagging from snow. And here's a volunteer that is uh, rolling the treatment. And then she paints the sides of the lumber that have been cut so that it doesn't rot. She's even got knee pads on. So while she's doing it, doesn't get sore knees. Doesn't look terribly unhappy in her job. Actually looks quite happy. And then we have our finished boardwalk. And here's Dave Scanlon. Uh, testing it out, the completed boardwalk. So you notice how it kind of rolls over the muck, this one. Uh, so this one, this that's why this design's good for that. It, it does roll over the, the terrain. And this boardwalk's been extended quite a bit since then. Now, then we have the idea of boardwalk that's a bit terraced. Um, so this is another example, but this is a boardwalk where um, uh, you had to gain elevation. So this boardwalk kind of interesting. So this ground, ground is starting to deteriorate. Um, we did this one last summer. So it had not only, this is a tricky one because it has to go around the corner and it has to gain elevation, which is a double whammy, a double, a double whammy of challenge here. So this one, we use shims uh, under, and I've got a picture from underneath where we'll see the shims. So you can see how it's like a set of stairs almost the way it goes up the land here. Um, so let's see, find another picture of it. So, so here's looking underneath it. There's now a set of steps here too at the bottom. You'll see here's the lower part of the boardwalk. And then under here, you see we have a shim to gain that elevation because you don't want your boardwalk going on an angle. You want your boardwalk segments pretty, pretty well flat. Uh, they sh an angled boardwalk is asking for someone to slide off it and hurt themselves. And then we got our trail marker up nice and high here. So here, and then there's a shim under here, some extra lumber to gain that extra elevation. And then there's a shim here. And then that connects right out where the trail does quite nicely. It's quite a nice little boardwalk. Um, here's another example of one that's sort of using single rounds. So we replaced the log rounds. It's quite aesthetic because it kind of contours through this bog. Um, quite a lovely little look to it. And uh, here's a combo section. This is a boardwalk combo and stair section. And here we had run out of the thicker four by sixes. And I remember what Udi had basically put just two of these down, just two by sixes and said, there you go. I said, that ain't gonna hold. So we doubled them up here. You see, we've put two two by sixes on top of one another. So it's a little stronger. And they're on these big yellow cedar rounds mixed with a combo of, um, of some step ramp steps. And we're gonna talk about stairs next. Uh, so that's, any questions on boardwalk? Again, these are just the tricks I've de developed over the years uh, building this kind of stuff. 
we used to as a club not really build too many boardwalks so this is kind of new so we're going to do uh stairs next and uh, then after that we do bridges last okay let me open up my stair step folder here open stairs open stairs okay hey oh sorry any questions while i'm opening my stair pictures here by the way this year i'm going to test out a, a new a new st experimental stair te technique actually this year which i'm looking forward to okay screen share there we go all right stairs we all see the stairs okay this is something called the ramp step um, the forestry manual basically describes the ramp step as, as, as basically these are ramp steps. So it's basically um, uh, basically a piece of wood uh, with, and the forest manual has it that you use actually wood stakes in the front. Um, what I've learned is the wood stakes is when you hammer the sledgehammer break and they rot away so fast that I got sick of that. So I went with rebar, three quarter or half inch. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I've since enhanced, sort of improved the design considerably, as you'll see. Um, so this is us starting to put in, there's me there sledging away in the, uh, some stairs on the water sprite trail. So these things have a number of benefits. Um, so they aren't really, their actual main purpose, believe it or not, is not for the sake of walking. It's for the sake of soil stabilization. Once you lose your topsoil, and the topsoil is, of course, all this stuff. Once you lose that, you get a root ladder. You get only rocks and a bunch of roots. And we probably many of us have encountered a root ladder before. They're really, really not fun uh, to walk on. So I remember the old uh, BC Parks Trail, specifically from Alder Flats up to the ridge, Panorama Ridge at Golden Ears, before they rerouted it was uh, quite a root ladder. So it can happen to the, be the, even the mightiest of agencies and plans can go to ruin once you lose your topsoil. So this stabilizes the topsoil. Uh, it's called a ramp step and it, um, you can use rocks too. Uh, but basically this keeps that soil in place so that uh, the trail um, you know, it does become a mess. I, I originally went with rebar because I actually was inspired by the trails that they built on the Gulf Islands and I was hiking them and I saw that they used rebar and saw how effective it was. Now, you notice at this bottom one here, they're on an angle. In this case, there's, there's some rocks under there so that the rebar cannot be driven straight in. So we drive them in, you know, at an angle so that we can get that in there uh, regardless of the fact that there's some rocks and weird stuff underneath the ground. Now, when you're building steps also, sometimes we use what's called cribbing. So cribbing is, this actually is a frame. Um, so a frame here is uh, basically a box to hold the dirt. So, whoops. Oh, and by the way, this is a picture of sort of the rebar. I, I, every time before a trail building season, I have to go out and source rebar. So I have my Part of the responsibility is I have my, my favorite scrap yards. Um, someone someone's needs to mute themselves, please. Um, so um, um, this is, um, oh, what was it? Yeah, rebar. So I, I go to scrap yards and I get it pre-cut, you know, and uh, to length. And um, this stuff is, is very versatile. A bit of a pain to get up there in place here. I think there's an all mute button here somewhere. Let me just look for that. Um, are we all muted? Jay, are you muted? Zach's not muted. Zach, are you muted? Oh, thank you. Okay, um, so this is uh, the idea of, a cri of cribbing. So cribbing is where we're building a frame, a box, in essence, to store the dirt. In this case, it's really actually hard to find gravel because uh, we, we, we filled this with gravel in, in the field. We actually harvested this gravel from a tree well, of all things. So sometimes you got to get creative. 
<laughs> I like the phrase, right? mute, uh, mute all was a great class management tool of learning last year. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so Jay is saying it wasn't me. It wasn't me. So I think it was Zach was the guilty one. <laughs> so um, the, uh, yeah, so here's the, uh, the, uh, where we're filling up a, a frame with gravel to, to create, this is a really steep little section here um, uh, where we're building an actual uh, cribbed step. Um, so going on in terms of ramp steps, Oh, and then here, I just put this in as an example, just for the sake of um, showing how high we try to get our tree mark, our uh, trail markers up because of the uh, snow here. Um, and this is uh, basically the part of the water sprite trail where it leaves the uh, logging road and enters the um, uh, forest. Uh, here's us in the process of building some ramp steps. Uh, so um, this is, you can see the rebar is just going in. There's some shoveling. So what we do is you first have to dig out the hole for the step for the wood, and then you have to backfill and stomp out the steps. So, you know, uh, that's what happens in the process of building a step. So we, that we dig this out uh, a hole. And sometimes you can see the sledgehammers here for pounding in the rebar. And then I have a next process, which is actually strapping these, which I'll talk about in a minute. Here's an advanced set. So this is the cribbing. Uh, so this was a, a really steep section, and I, and I knew that if we didn't really overbuild this section, that it would be blown out real fast. So we uh, really overbuilt this section. Uh, and you can see it's heavily uh, reinforced with a ton of rebar and lumber, and these, you can see they're even screwed together. Chris, one technique I, I've seen um, contractors use is taking a log and making like a half length of the log with it, and then using that on one side to attach the the cribbing to or the stairs to? Oh yeah, you certainly can. And you can also notch them and make stairs out of them. Um, so yeah, you, this, I've done, there's a lot of things you can do with logs. In this case, there aren't really any logs available in this section of trail. So we're having to bring in material because there aren't actually uh, any decent logs in this particular area. Oh, and this is what the cribbing looks like when it's done now. So there's the finished product, which is quite magnificent. Look at that, yeah. Look at that trail building glory. So there it is, controlled. Now I've taken some of these techniques and kind of uh, uh, advanced them. So this is now the ramp step where we now have, you see I've added stainless or galvanized plumber strap screwed into the, um, uh, the uh, two by six. And these are two by sixes here. Those two by sixes, by the way, um, are the ones uh, where these on top. So these are the traction plates. You can see them. These traction plates are the things that are on top of those steps. They're screwed in. So this is a, a more deluxe. We've, we've sort of improved the technique. It also looks pretty impressive. So you see how lovely. This is a really steep section. Uh, and it's... And although this year I might actually put an actual flight of stairs in here with uh, two actual frames on the side. So this has the strapping. Yeah, those, those look like pretty high steps. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it is. But I mean, it's just, so basically we just didn't have the, the, the materials, but this year we might actually put full on stairs in here. Yeah. The thing is when you have eight kilometers and a half kilometers of trail, we, you know, we have to be very selective about if we're actually going to sterify something. Yeah. Depending this, on the usage you're using, um, uh, four by sixes is probably better than two by sixes. Two, two by sixes run out too fast. Well, the reason why I use two by sixes on this side is the four by four, four by fours aren't, they're too narrow. In other words, they don't go far enough in the soil. No, I'm saying four, four by six. Four, oh, by four, six. four by six. Yeah, then, but the only, in the case of these ramp steps, two by six are just a lot cheaper and lighter to carry yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. It's again, it's just, just the practicals of, of carrying this stuff because we carry all this in, right? So this is looking down. Uh, in this case, we've used a natural log on the top. Uh, actually, so this is, I say this is natural, kind of capped by natural material here at the top. Um, this summer, actually next week, I'd like to actually put an actual flight of stairs in here with a frame. Um, so that's the plan, but this stuff is perfectly fine as it is. Okay, so that's some step techniques you can do. And there's other, you can get creative and use rocks and all sorts of stuff too. Are there any questions on steps before I go on to bridges? 
Bridges. All right, Bridges. Bridges it is. Okay, we'll close this. And Bridges. My Bridges is, I didn't have time to put it in order here, so it's a little out of order. Oh, we have lots of bridge pictures here. Could have done more, but this will do. Okay, Bridges. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit out of order here in a mess, so I'm going to try to uh, go any order here. Oh, yes, we all like building bridges. Bridges are fun. Okay, one of the things we often employ a lot in bridges, um, um, I'm going to, we'll get to this picture in a minute, um, is uh, the come along. So, so I'm just orienting my pictures here. Yeah, there's a lot of learning in this, these pictures. So the first bridge I'm going to talk about is the lower skull head bridge. Uh, I've always been very, very good at uh, tug of war. They always put me as the anchor at the back. So you can see here I'm in the back about to haul this log over. Um, but we basically, there was already this one log here. And what we're doing is we're building a, a footbridge. This is using logs uh, across this smaller creek. Um, uh, by the way, the simplest kind of little bridge, uh, sorry, before I do that, this is the simplest one. So here is a, just a little, a little, a little squirt, uh, a little one across, but nevertheless, it's a bit of a pain. There's a lot of water in there. It lasts most of the year round. It's a cross ditch on the log road and the water comes in, seems to like to sit there. So and I, and we couldn't drain it. So we made this little bridge and all it is is basically a boardwalk segment. Um, and that has one in the middle in case of snow load. Now, the nice thing is this also becomes a ski bridge in the winter. So this is the most basic uh, bridge design of the bunch. Simple two four by sixes and yellow cedar rounds. Uh, really, really simple. And it's got the expansion metal deck to it as well. Uh, then we have another kind of bridge. This is um, also, this is one 12 foot bridge. It's a 12 by uh, 12 footer. These are 12 foot. Uh, two, uh, four by sixes. This is on a rock gabion. Uh, so I mean, the gabion is the part on the banks of the creek that supports the bridge. So you see everyone, these rock piles here, right? These rock piles are, are referred to the gabion. There's generally sort of three ways we do gabions. Uh, gabions can be done like this. The simplest is rock. Uh, another one is uh, wood. And I'll show you an example of a wood gabion. And now what's commonly done is gabions that are done in a mesh bag. So this um, contractors will do this and we've done this too, where you have a mesh bag and then you put the mesh bag on the ground and you fill it full of rocks and then you put the beams on top. So that's a, the, the old mesh bag gabion. Uh, so this one has, has the uh, rocks, it has the 12 foot beams and actually you can't see it, but there's actually rebar driven into the ground. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail as to why you want to have rebar or metal that goes in from the bridge directly into the earth. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so uh, going back here, so this going back to this larger log bridge. Uh, so we started off here. So one of the things is we try to finding natural building materials is great. So here we're using a come along or pulley system, we spike the end of the log and we're hauling it out of the, the basically an old logging pile. These are, this is old debris left from logs. We pre-cut it and now the gentlemen here are using pry bars to kind of help the pulley guide it along. Um, and here's what our pulley system looks like. This is a come along. This is a very useful device. Um, so it's sort of a ratchet system, and this is tied to, I think, a tree at the top, and we're using it to assist hauling that heavy log into place. Um, so now, uh, so that is connected to that. And then eventually we do get it into place and see we get it there, and then we decide to do the tug of war thing. Here, in this case, we have a wood gabion. You can see on the bank these logs. And these logs, a lot of them are spiked together with these big uh, 12 inch spikes. 
This is where an example we use the big common spikes. Now this is where uh, both logs are getting into place. And you can see here the wood gabion on the bank. And obviously uh, because the, the, you want this not to get washed in the creek. So this is all spiked together uh, heavily with uh, those 12 inch spikes. And uh, the next step, so now the two logs are basically in place. And now that the logs are in place, so here I am testing it out, making sure it's level. Now the next step, of course, is uh, here's Paul Kubik, who is milling the top of those logs or cutting, sorry, cutting off the round part so that uh, when we put the deck on, it'll be nice and level and, and smooth. So a chainsaw is a very good way rather than using a hatchet, which would take forever. And uh, now here goes the deck. Oh, that's a different one, Bridge, sorry. There's the deck going on. So these are once again, two by sixes with spacers. And again, always keeping space between your lumber so that they don't crack under pressure. And you can see the non-slip going on on top of that. And so voila, you have a bridge. No handrail here. Um, if you need a handrail on this, you shouldn't be hiking the trail, quite frankly, <laughs> I think. <laughs> So that's sort of a classic log bridge. Um, another example of a log bridge in a, over a bigger creek um, is the Skullhead Creek. And see, the Skullhead Creek is considerably bigger. These are rock gabions as well. And you notice we've used, we used the come longs. We brought them from back in here. There's a pile of old logs next to this tree. We hauled them over onto the rock gabions. This creek gets so full in the spring melt uh, we put this in 2017 and it's, it's stood solid since then, never a problem. It's actually been up to the top of the bank, uh, right almost where his foot is uh, in water. And it's like with only a foot short of the beams here, it really swells up good on the odd year. Um, so here, once again, two big logs, and then we have a deck uh, going in on top. We've since improved it. We have lovely nice ramps on either end of that bridge now. It's quite luxurious these days. And then this is uh, them putting on the decking on that skull head bridge, see all that water moving underneath. And then what we did is we took the chainsaw and just cut off the ends of the wood. Uh, so it's all nice and even. Then we get to different designs of bridges, some more sophisticated, some less. Uh, so this is a crude bridge that we did, kind of cute. So this is a bridge actually on Skullhead Creek above on the, on the loop around. This is a pretty rustic bridge. It's also hammered into the ground with giant lag bolts. Uh, basically, it's just two logs. And what we did is we filled up this cup with gravel harvested from the creek. So the traction, the non-slip in this case, is gravel <laughs> rather than non-slip. And uh, that bridge has been, is, 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 I really like it. It's really, it's crude, but it, it works really well. And it's, it's kind of cute. So this is the day we were putting it in. I'm actually a bit of a, I actually lifted the entire bridge myself here. So by myself on this end, so people could get stuff in back in doing the Hulk move. And then the, this is it here when we first put it in. Uh, so the you know, bridges don't necessarily have to be uh, all polished, uh, but it works quite effectively. I've never heard complaints. Uh, then we get into sort of the more manicured bridge. Uh, style using four by sixes. So this one uh, we put in last uh, two summers ago. And you notice this is where we got into pre-drilling. So we have a large drill, uh, a Hilti drill. And so we pre-drilled the ends of the two by sixes and then sledgehammered in the rebar. And this rebar goes right into the ground. Some of them actually are capped lag bolts, not these particular ones. Um, and you can see here's one of the volunteers pounding in the rebar. And the reason why is, is just in case, the, and there's, oh, there's our drill there. Just in case the water gets really high from the melt and hits the bridge, you don't want the bridge suddenly just washing away. You want it anchored to something. And especially because this is not on wood, this one's on rock gabions. So these lag bolts are going into the earth. Uh, generally a very good idea for your bridge. Um, here's some more pictures of that bridge. You notice about this bridge is it's three beams wide rather than two. So this is three. Uh, and nice about using um, dimensional lumbers, you can kind of calculate the width of your bridge. So I know that this is a foot and a half 
because it's three uh, four by sixes uh, by, by 12 foot. Also, the original road went down here. So we actually moved the bridge up and rerouted the trail to the point where there was constriction. So that way we didn't, wouldn't have to build a structure in the middle. It could be freestanding. Um, and, and here's a, uh, another picture of that segment there. Um, and then of course, this is, we, because it has an approach, it has the bridge portion, and then there's a side ramp, a boardwalk approach for it. So here's the creek and water coming down here. And then there's the uh, little boardwalk approach to it. So the hikers come pouring in here and, uh, and there they go. This is now adding the non-slip to that bridge. And uh, see if I can find, there's one more here of it. Um, oh, I think that's it. Now, if we go to a more serious bridge, um, yeah, and again, the Rock Gabion Bridge. So a more serious example of a bridge uh, is, oh, someone's got a chat here for me. What is that? Some creeks are avi paths in winter. Can a bridge be effective from avi? Um, well, as an example, it's a Sigurd bridge, which got blown out uh, twice now by uh, basically an ice dam formed up above, and it blows every couple of years and takes it out. Um, I think what you want, I've never had lost a bridge myself. Um, maybe you don't want to put your bridge up too high, but if it's like a huge avi path, um, I suggest you want a cable car or a suspension bridge, you know, something that you can put up high. Um, um, in some cases, like BC Parks, I think of their their trail, you know, going into Mamquam, crossing Rubble, uh, not Rubble Creek, sorry, um, uh, I suddenly drawn a blank. When you're heading to Opal Cone, you know, they make that seasonal because it'll be wiped out if they don't. So there's no no real kind of exact answer to that it's 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 uh, it's kind of place specific. Now this is the Upper Stroit Water Sprite Bridge. This one actually is a, a little bit heavier duty. Um, so this one has got the big beams on the bottom and a deck, and it's got the expansion metal on top. Um, but what this one has, because this one is at the eight kilometer mark and it has huge snow loads, uh, Paul Kubik and a couple others engineered, and you can't see them steal snow trusses on the end, which actually provide counter pressure so that when the weight and the huge weights are on the middle of this, there's an, a lot of counter force pulling apart on this bridge, tensioning it so that it doesn't crack down in the middle. So far, so good on this one. And what's interesting is we haven't lost a single bridge yet at Water Sprite. Um, so, you know, considering some of those bridges have been there almost five years now, that's pretty impressive. Um, I had one bridge actually was interesting. This is a kind of an interesting story and, and, and relevant is um, this bridge here is this Gabion started to fail. I came in one year and it was starting to, it was starting to sag. So the whole bridge was tilting this way. Um, so what we did is I sent Udi back. He got my Jeep jack. We stuck the jack in here, jacked it up, put in another piece of wood. And then we put in about eight or nine of these suckers. And it's been fine ever since it hasn't budged. So you sometimes have to come up with innovative solutions when you have interesting problems. So in this case, using the Jeep Jack to jack up the bridge worked, worked quite brilliantly. Um, I think now, so I've been, I've been blabbing for an hour and a half here. So I, what I'm going to do now is uh, open it up for, uh, for Q and A. So let me just close the uh, preview here. And, uh, and uh, open up for those who would like to ask me questions. Uh, I do have, by the way, have my first uh, water sprite trip I'm leading, I think in the uh, second week of uh, June. So if you actually want to get your hands in there, uh, then, uh, then that's the, that would be the way to, uh, to get your hands, hands dirty. So questions. Have any tips or tricks to getting all the materials and tools up to where you're building? It depends on how far it is, right? Um, if it's only a couple kilometers up, then um, 
the in which case you carrying it up is you just want lots of bodies you know the more bodies you have the easier stuff it is to get stuff in uh last year uh we spent two trips just bringing in materials to do a lot of that work you saw there it was just human mules uh in the case of um in the case of uh the upper parts of the trails we used a helicopter to fly it up uh, so that there's a four kilometer mark. There was, a, we flew up about 50 or 400 pounds of lumber. Um, tool wise, if you're talking about getting brush cutters up to the eight kilometer mark, occasionally we will fly crew up and then they, so they bring the gas and the tools up and then they clear downhill. So clearing with the brush cutter downhill, you know, is always a little easier. So that's the odd case where helicopter assistance might be useful and required is where it's in quite a ways with those tools. And then you work out with them. That's my, sort of, but the more hands you have, the less onerous it, is, onerous it is to carry. You know, the biggest crew I had was 50 and it was like moving up the mountain like a giant Pac-Man in terms of trail clearing. <laughs> so the more you have, the better it is in a way. But you also, if you have a very large crew and you're a trail boss, you need to be able to manage people really well and, uh, you know, make sure everyone knows what they're doing make sure everyone's happy and having a good time. And that required, you know, you shouldn't start out as your first trail to clearing a uh, trip with 50 people, uh, work your way up to that. Um, so I got a couple other questions here. So I got a question on trail markers. At what point would you use flagging versus permanent markers and pick one over the other? Um, I, when I first put in a route, like for instance, when the water spread trail first went in, I used flagging tape. Um, right as the initial, uh, when I was in essence kind of figuring, optimizing and figuring out where this trail was going to go. And once I figured out, okay, it's going to be here, this is where it's going to stay for good, uh, then we put in all the markers. One thing that's good is like in the connector trail, the wire spread trail, you want your trail markers to be on both ways. So you want them looking when you're going in and going out. So you imagine that people are coming out by headlamp. So if you're putting them all one way, then that's not going to be useful. So you, you do want your trail markers on both sides of the tree. Um, also, do you need a trail agreement to put in permanent markers? Yes, you. in theory, uh, if you're on Crown Land, you should have a section 57 or 56 authorization before you're putting in trail markers. Um, it's not quite all that black and white, meaning there are grandfather trails. You know, there's stuff that are clearly, you know, a ton of people are using and they're, uh, you know, and uh, like, for instance, in the North Shore Mountains, where there's a lot of search and rescue on a couple trails up there and people added trail markers, they weren't necessarily authorized trails, but it was still desirable to put those in because um, people were getting lost and everyone's using those trails. So there's a bit of give and take on that particular question. Any other questions? Are there any topics? What is the best thing to do with the branches and brush you remove from them when they're maintaining a, tra maintaining a trail? We throw it over the side. So um, if we have some brush swamp uh, clears in the front, the swampers will take the stuff and throw it over the bank. Because uh, the last thing you want is, is it on the trail. Sometimes there won't be a place to throw it over the trail. And what actually will have a good team, the chainsaw operator will recognize that and they will proactively, I've worked with Andrew Wong and he'll see that we're working in an area and there isn't a place to throw the debris. And he'll actually chainsaw out an area on the side of the trail to put the debris and then go to work. And then we're throwing all the stuff in, swamping into that little zone. So that's a very useful thing for a chainsaw operator and crew to know. Um, so if there isn't a place to throw it, then you can make a place by just chainsawing out a little area. How many hours a day do you allocate to a project realistically? It depends on the trails, the amount of volunteers, of course, but how many hours per day in the planning stages? We so talk about actually, oh, oh, I see. I see another, another one. I'll, I'll go back to that one. So um, uh, generally I do a turnaround time and it depends on the area. Um, usually three o'clock is my turnaround time. Uh, if we are say working on the bottom three kilometers or four of a trail, um, or I might ask as the, uh, say, Hey, we've hit our turnaround time. And I mean, last summer we hit turnaround time about three thirty, and everyone's still working. I said, we've, we're past turnaround time. You guys can stop. And they wouldn't. So we ended up at about four thirty, and they're still working. So, you know, it depends on your crew and the enthusiasm. Um, you know, the earlier start, the better, uh, cause it's uh, cooler. I generally don't work 
in the, I don't like working in July and August uh, in the heat of the day. Another aspect, like just lightly misting is best conditions. Another aspect I didn't mention is, is be very careful about trail building in uh, high fire conditions. Uh, because even this, if you are pounding this on a piece of rebar, you will have metal slag come off of it and it could start a huge forest fire. So if you have high forest fire conditions, stay home, you know, don't, don't be trail building, uh, unless you're maybe using loppers, you know, or something like that. No chainsaws, brush cutters and sledgehammers and stuff like that. Or when you're dealing in high fire, um, and I don't know about those planning stages. I do spend a lot of time pre-planning. So, you know, I'm days ahead as a trail boss, getting, making sure all the supplies are there, organizing the people, the rides. There's, there's a lot involved if you're a trail boss, uh, with especially the bigger the crew. Small crew, it's more casual. Bigger crew, it, the bigger the crew, the more planning. Uh, would anyone have advice for somebody attending your event in June? Anything to do beforehand uh, that we are more prepared, easier to start? Uh, you know, just show up. Uh, quite frankly, if you got a decent pair of boots, uh, and your hiking gear, um, basically enthusiasm and hard work as you'll learn as you, as you go. Um, you know, the best way to learn is in many ways by doing it. Um, certainly I learned by doing it, uh, and in, in the field. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so we did, I didn't have, we didn't have workshops like this, unfortunately, unfortunately back in, you know, when I was starting out, you know, it's, it's really nice that, that we, we have the technology to do these kinds of things now. Recommend what leather work gloves to? Um, it depends on the time of year. Yeah, I, I've yeah. worked, uh, you know, I've worked in the winter and I've actually used uh, crab fisherman gloves in the winter yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the fuzzy linings. And then in the summer, you know what my favorite kind are? Um, I've actually got a pair just sitting over there are the ones where they're rubber on the front and fabric on the back. Um, I love those. Those are my favorite kinds. So they're like blue rubber palms and then fabric on the back. So they breathe and are cool. But at the same time, they're waterproof and grippy on the front. Um, the big leather ones, I find stain your, I, like the cheap ones, they'll stain your hands yellow uh, when they get wet. And I just, they're awful. You know, I like, oh. yeah, yeah those, <laughs> I've got a bag full of about like 12 pairs of gloves. So I have extras for a crew, but I have my own personal preference of glove. And it is those, you can get them at, work, at work, Mark's Work Warehouse and stuff in, in most places. Um, you know, again, fabric on the back, rubber on the front, uh, unless you're dealing with really horrendous conditions. And, you know, I've actually was trail building in the snow once, in which case the lobster fisherman gloves were fantastic. <laughs> so any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay. You know, sometimes short and sweet. Well, short an hour and 45 minutes isn't necessarily short. So, um, you know, thank you all for coming and participating. Uh, I'll stay for a few more minutes in case anyone wants to ask me any questions without uh, the horde here. I, I hope you found this useful and uh, I really do hope to see some of you on my crew and some of you out there with us, you know, you're, you're, you're all welcome and uh, it's a lot of fun and it's always great to, to give back to the community.